Good morning. You're very welcome. Looks like Nigel is keen to get going, so uh, let's do that, shall we? Um, let me just give you the notices. Let's spend a, just a moment looking at this one. Living wholeheartedly as followers of Jesus for the transformation of the world. Just think about that. Okay, next one, please. Thank you. Nigel will be speaking. I presume he may be speaking on this particular verse. And uh, hopefully, we looked at the first uh, transformation of the world by becoming followers of Jesus. This will also help us to know how we can become that or move on towards that. Thank you. Okay, uh, children and discussion. No, there's no discussion group. They're staying in but there will be kids' faith, and the borders are staying in as well. Prayer ministry will be at the, end of the church, at the end of the service. If you'd like some prayer, please come over there. We'd love to pray with you. Thank you. Okay, these are the usual notices. We'll move on, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, that's fine. We've dealt with all that. Okay, we'll keep going. David isn't here. Otherwise, Dave, I would have got David to speak about that. Let's move on. And next one, please. Okay, Rachel. Come and tell us something about this. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, last month, we had our first family encounter. Um, and just to talk a little bit about that was, it was held in this hall, and it was for mainly for children, but everyone is welcome, um, and families. And uh, we had encounter stations, we called them, around the station, and it's an interactive way of encountering God. So, for example, over in this corner, we had a table, and you had, um, you know, we got the kids, invited the kids over to physically set the table but leaving a space for Jesus and then having to think about well what would we say to Jesus if we had dinner with Jesus and um, what would we like to ask him what would we you know tell him and um, what would he ask us to do um, or he ask of us and just kind of um, having different stations over here we had Lego they got to you know build something and think about maybe what's God trying to tell them to what they're building um, and we had music throughout so we have our next one and um, it's on uh, Saturday the 27th of May from 3 to 4 p.m. in the hall again and I really encourage um, any families, children um, or anyone that wants to come and um, experience Family Encounter please do come, um, it was a lovely atmosphere and um, it, we really did feel the presence of God. And you could stay there for the oh and it's right after. Um, also two things, next thing is uh, next Saturday on Saturday the 13th um, myself, Jonathan Fall, and Sarah O'Connor, who are also members of a church, are running either a 10K or a half a marathon um, in aid of the Matter Foundation um, in memory of our dear friend Luke Doherty, who passed away last September. Um, and we've been training uh, some more than others, um, but we've been training, I've been training for this run since last November, and um, so it's mad that's already come up, but there is a donation link that has been sent in the newsletter if you would like to support, um, or if cash is, you know, an easier option for you, um, absolutely we can take cash and we will make the online donation ourselves. Every little helps and it's for an amazing cause, so thank you. That's great, Rachel, thank you so much. Okay, uh, if anyone is exploring about local preachers, there's a, uh, a Zoom meeting happening on Tuesday the 7th. Um, we'll move on next, please. Thank you. Oh, prayer night. Very important. Uh, probably one of the key aspects of our church life is prayer meeting on every, well, not every Wednesday, every, what, first, second Wednesday of each month that takes place. Can I encourage as many of you to come because it is a vital, vital ministry of our church. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is... St. John's Gospel Choir. There's a big notice up there somewhere. Thank you. That's on the 11th, and the finances are being raised for uh, the Alzheimer's Society at the Capuchin Day Center. That's on the 11th of May, uh, and there's a £15 charge for that, and it's the St. John's Gospel and Dublin Band. Thank you. Okay, car boot sale. I've already given those notices, so we'll move on to the next Summer Club, again, that will be coming up, and we'll just leave that up at some, uh, for, on our website. We'll move on to the next. Okay, Stephen is away on sabbatical. If you didn't know that, you do now. Move on. Okay, that's it. We'll move on. Up to you, Nigel. Thank you.
Uh, a very good morning to you all. It's absolutely great uh, to be with you and uh, to be leading in this uh, service of communion. Uh, always a joy to be presiding at the Lord's table. And just to say the table is open to all and all are welcome. And as we are gather around the table a little later in the service and we're breaking bread together, um, all who would love to uh, draw closer to Christ are welcome to come and to share in that meal uh, with us. Um, I'm, I'm really struck, you know, because uh, one of the things I'm going to be speaking about today um, will actually be prayer. And, and I'm, I'm delighted that Aaron had highlighted that the church prayer meeting uh, will be on Wednesday evening. And, and these are events that I don't often get a chance to, to, to be involved with, with a larger group of people. And, and that's one of the things that I miss sometimes um, because chaplaincy can be quite a, a solitary existence uh, when it comes to things like prayer and so on. So if you're at all free on Wednesday evening, I would really, really encourage you, um, if at all possible, uh, to come and, and, and to share in that. Our call to worship this morning is taken from 1 Thessalonians 5. And uh, um, Paul, he, he loves to write about particular themes, but rejoicing is definitely one of those. Uh, that's very close to his heart. And in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.14, he says this, um, or uh, 16, Be joyful always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And to put that in context in regard to all circumstances, Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We stand together to sing our opening hymn this morning, Christ the Lord is risen today. Thank you, Stephen.
Glory to you, O God. You raised Jesus from the grave, bringing us victory over death and giving us eternal life. Glory to you, O Christ. For us and for our salvation, you overcame death and opened the gate to everlasting life. Glory to you, O Holy Spirit. You lead us into the truth and breathe new life into us. Glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. If we have fallen into despair, Lord, forgive us. If we have failed to hope in you, Lord, forgive us. If we have been fearful of death, Lord, forgive us. If we have forgotten the victory of Christ, Lord, forgive us. May the living God raise us from despair, give us victory over sin, and set us free in Christ. Almighty God, of your own free goodness and mercy, you have created us. And through the resurrection of your only begotten Son, you have given us hope. Guard us by your love and in your wisdom. Keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first uh, reading this morning is from uh, the book of Psalms, and I'm reading from Psalm 1, and it really sets the context for where we'll go a little later in the service uh, when we're uh, sharing together in uh, the book of Philippians and continuing the theme uh, of working our way through Philippians as we reach Philippians 3 uh, together. And this is what the psalmist writes. Blessed is the man and woman who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord on his law they meditate day and night. They are like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Amen. Um, Rachel's going to uh, do our, this month's uh, children's songs with us, and I think it could be uh, Our Lighthouse, which I love. So I'm excited about this, Rachel, so I'm very, I have high expectations, high expectations. I expect awesome actions from you then, if that's the case. Um, before we start into our kids' song of this month and I introduce it, um, can I invite the kids up to the front? Because I'm going to tell you a little about what the meaning of the song is. So there's loads of seats up the front here. So, I have a question to ask you guys. Can I get the first uh, image up, please? Can anyone tell me what that really, really, really tall building is? A lighthouse. A lighthouse. Bonus point for anyone who tell me where that lighthouse is. Yes, it is Hookhead in uh, Wexford, um, where I've spent actually many family summers growing up, so I often love going to this lighthouse. Um, but when we think about this lighthouse, what is a lighthouse for? What does a lighthouse do? Why do we have lighthouses? Hold on, you've answered one question, so let me see. Yeah? Yeah, because so what we said was sometimes it's really, really dark and there's a massive light, isn't there, that helps us see. And yeah, what were you going to say? Were you going to say something like the same thing? Yeah. 
Yeah, and you know what? You're right. There is a massive, massive, massive light bulb on the very, very top of that. And what it does, it's not really for like you know us to see, but it's for boats that are in the sea, okay, and in the ocean. And some of these boats, when they're traveling at night, the lighthouse helps them. It spirals and it goes around and around and around. This absolutely massive bulb, and it shows them if you know if there's any rocks ahead or other boats or things like that that they might hit into. So it keeps the boat safe and it's their light to guide them. But even though this bulb is huge, like I mean massive, 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 bigger than any bulbs we have in our house, um, the next image, what's actually inside the top of a lighthouse is something like this. Now, this isn't actually from the image of the hookhead. This is just a generic stock image. But what this is, is it's layers of mirrors. And you know what they do, right? So even though this light bulb is massive, these mirrors are in layers around it, okay? And the light bulb will bounce off one of the mirrors, which then that light bounces off another mirror, bounces off another one, bounces off another one, so that that light can reach ships the furthest away. Oh, wow. Okay, find it on the web. Um, so that it can be the boats that are furthest and furthest away can even see this light, and it can guide them and protect them and keep them safe, okay? And in the Bible, and the song that we're going to be singing today is called My Lighthouse. And in Matthew 5, it tells something similar to us, okay? Because what God is saying is that he is the light of the world, but we are also the light of the world through him. So in Matthew 5, verses 14, it says, you are the light of the world, like a city on the hilltop that cannot be hidden. Just think about that. A city on the hilltop, so the very point of a hill. It's not hidden. Everyone can see it. Um, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. So, for example, we don't go around and putting on lights in our house to uh, you know, brighten up a room and then covering them. No, they have a purpose. They're there usually on a stand or something like this where they fill a room full of light so that people can see. Um, and in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So thinking about that image up there, right? Kind of like we are the layers. So there's the big, big, big light, the big light bulb, which is light of the world, Jesus. Then there's the mirrors that reflect that light off each other and spread it even further. And that's what Jesus is asking us to do. That if we show kindness, if we show respect to each other, then we can spread the light of the world to other people and what that is. Does that make sense? Yeah? But also, light helps us in the darkness and helps us see. So also Jesus is our light of the world and that he guides us and helps us through anything that we may go through. Because sometimes life is messy. At any age, life is messy. Um, but the main thing is that there is always light and that is Jesus. So we're going to do our song for the month, which is My Lighthouse. Um, I'm going to invite you all to stand. There is loads of actions in this song, so try keep up. Um, but Mackie's apparently really good at this.
Yeah, straight away. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Well done, everyone. Um, I invite you all that kids' face and arc is on now, so if you'd like to leave now, you can. Thank you so much. You got a Love Wren Collective. I think they're back on tour again now um, after COVID and they'll be coming to Dublin soon. I know they'll be playing in Belfast in a while. And for the boarders, just to know that the band who wrote that all went to Mr. Johnson's and Mr. Hart's school. So they did. And uh, for those of you that remember Mr. Carson, he was actually in class with them. Uh, they were, uh, the band were from his year group and they've gone on to massive things. It's been so, so good. Uh, Dorothy uh, is going to read for us uh, from the New Testament now. Thank you, Dorothy. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Thank you, Dorothy. Um, Paul's in prison at this stage in his life and in his career. Um, I think we're sitting probably around about um, AD uh, 62, maybe 65, in and around there. So he's in prison. He's either um, being held in Ephesus or he's in, in Rome at this stage. And it's extraordinary that, that he would actually write this. And, and he talks about what his purpose was prior to, to engaging with the risen Jesus to meeting Christ. It's extraordinary. He's got absolutely everything locked and loaded. Everything's in place. And as far as he's concerned and his community's concerned, he's got life together. He's a made man, if you want to use a mafia term. Um, he, he's, everything's correct for him. It's perfect. He's born into the right tribe. Um, he's, a, he's a Benjaminite, and, and the fact that he's actually able to trace his heritage is really, really significant for them. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews. He studied uh, at the feet of Gamaliel uh, in, in, the, in the Jerusalem University. And he's of the sect of Pharisees who were local leaders, local teachers, who wanted to set incredibly high standards for people to follow. And in terms of him doing that, as an example, he was amazing, absolutely amazing. And he's able to claim, as far as the law is concerned, I'm totally faultless. We would say that in school terms, no detentions, no lines, no essays, no criticism for the teachers. This guy's a straight-A student, so it is. And yet, I'm puzzled by this, because if his purpose is to lay out how good he actually is, he also stops short, because he doesn't announce the biggest thing in his armory, which is he's also a Roman citizen, and he's a Roman citizen by birth, and that, that's how he's been able to make his appeal to Caesar. That's why he's still uh, a prisoner, and actually, at this point, it's why he's still alive, because he's made his appeal to Caesar. But he doesn't go there. He stops short. And I wonder if he isn't writing all of this and then giggling to himself and going, my goodness, I'm writing all this. I spent my life trying to figure out who I am, get my identity sorted, find my tribe and, and the group of people that I could be most comfortable with, and uh, persecuting everybody else who doesn't fall into that category, giving people a hard time, criticizing them, nitpicking, and going after them uh, for, for all their faults and feelings. And he stopped short because he probably was writing that and then going, my goodness, Jesus was able to, to, to trace his ancestry straight to the throne of David. He's able to go straight back to Adam. He's able to go straight back as a son of God. Wow, how amazing is that instead? And, uh, and I wonder, as Paul is looking at what his, all that purpose, all that energy, all that effort that was expended in becoming someone who on the outside was amazing, uh, and yet on the inside obviously harbored such anxiety, such fear, such a sense of inadequacy that he just became, as far as the early church was concerned, a rabid dog. He's just going, my goodness, how did I get it so wrong? Um, I was speaking to somebody who just passed away uh, last Christmas, um, uh, a little while before they had passed. They were the CEO of a huge company, a huge financial company uh, in the UK and, uh, and Northern Ireland. Um, ridiculously incredible career. And as I sat with them over a cup of coffee and they talked, they were just going, I, I shake my head sometimes and wonder, what was I doing? What was going on? What was happening? What was I pursuing? What was I pouring all my effort and my energy and my life into? Because literally, there's nothing to show for this. There's nothing to show. And he said, I actually wonder, you know, because he was thinking about his children who are growing up and living all over the globe. 
and just going, I, I wonder should I have poured my effort and my energy in a slightly different direction? I, I have confidence uh, that as they sit at the feet of Christ now in that nearer presence and in glory, that all that anxiety and all that worry has washed away. But my question is this, what's your purpose? What are you pursuing? What, what are you willing to expend your life on gaining? And are you actually pursuing things? Is your purpose something that's going to last a lifetime and then last the lifetime that's yet to come? That's my question uh, this morning. And Paul goes, everything I was doing before I met Christ, I now count as rubbish, a waste of time and effort, because to be in relationship with God is not about fluke of birth. It's not about your heritage or your bloodline or your DNA or your race or anything like that. It's not about all these outward things that we pursue. It's a matter of the heart. And he says that now I'm of the circumcision of the heart. I, I, I want to be worshiping God, not just by what I say and, and, and do, but with the inward attitude of my heart. And that's what he wants to pass on. Uh, I don't know what you've passed on recently. Uh, yesterday, somebody tooted at me while I was driving for the first time in a very long time, and I'm not happy about it this morning. So, confession is good for the soul uh, before we come to the Lord's table. So, I was sitting at traffic lights. And I'll tell you exactly where I was. I was sitting at traffic lights uh, down at Dundrum, and I didn't hit the accelerator within a nanosecond of the speed of light, of the light turning from red to green, and a new driver with an end plate, baseball cap on, slunk low in the seats. I don't even know how he saw that the lights had, uh, had changed. I don't even know how you could see out through the dark sunglasses. And I know all this information because I took a moment to observe my nemesis in the rear view mirror as he sat on the horn as I missed it. I was just like, oh, you're joking me. You're joking. So I, I drove off. Uh, about five minutes later, I'm at, no, it's about two and a half minutes later, I'm sitting at Milltown. I'm heading to uh, uh, cross Moorhampton Road to get parked up uh, for the game yesterday afternoon. And uh, the guy in front of me wasn't moving quickly enough. And in a fit of righteous indignation, I passed on the encouragement that had been passed on to me. <laughs> and I got on the horn to the guy in front. And uh, the people, my guests in the car with me, all were just looking at me going, who are you? What are you doing? And I go, yeah, I'm just getting this out of my system, really. It's, it's, it's good to pass it on. <laughs> Paul is now pressing on into something incredibly valuable. He's pursuing a matter of the heart because the issue at stake is, is the heart of the matter. And, and he's pressing on now to attain this knowledge of Christ through sharing in his sufferings and pursuing the resurrection somehow. Because he hasn't got it all figured out. He doesn't know how this all works. But he knows that Jesus is real and that living life as a friend of Christ makes a real difference in the world. Where is he? He's in prison. He's surrounded by the Praetorian Guard. He's surrounded by people who he knows at some stage in the near future are going to execute him. He's dealing with people who know that in the near future they're going to be ordered to execute him. And how does he conduct himself? Not by getting on the horn and pointing out their inadequacy, not by getting on the horn and, and telling them they're not moving quickly enough or they're not good enough, or they're not up to scratch, or they've got the wrong DNA, or they're the wrong culture, or the wrong race, or the wrong religion. He shares his relationship with Jesus with them. In other ways, uh, in the scriptures, we read about members of the Praetorian card giving their lives to Christ and coming to faith because Paul is no longer trying to be something on the outside. He's allowing the Holy Spirit to transfer, 
transform him on the inside. He's pursuing goodness. He's pursuing nobility. He's pursuing truth. He's pursuing peace. He's being honorable. He's being kind. He's being generous, even in the face of the ultimate provocation, even in the face of knowing his future is uncertain. He doesn't get bitter. He doesn't allow himself to be filled with rancor. He doesn't get angry. And what's he writing to the church of Philippians? Dorothy read it for us so beautifully, but that opening line, I don't mind telling you again, rejoice in the Lord. Our opening call to worship was rejoice in the Lord always. Pray continuously. It doesn't matter what's going on around about us. It doesn't matter what's happening on the stock market. It doesn't matter uh, what's happening with our health. All of these things are important to a point, but they're not ultimate reality. They're not ultimate truth. And Paul's pointing to something greater, something sustainable. It's what the psalmist says, because he's not just talking about a forest glade that's been planted perhaps in the Kidron Valley that he's looking out at and over from Jerusalem, or he remembers from his childhood somewhere a glade in Bethlehem. No, he's talking about what is built and what is planted in glory. He's talking about his future hope. How do we get to heaven? How do we attain this resurrection? How do we live life to the full now? even when we're disabled, even when we're inhibited, even when we're in chains, even when we're panicking about whether or not we've accomplished enough work for our exams or for our junior cert or our leaving cert, or whether we've got everything that our boss is expecting of us to be accomplished for tomorrow morning done or not. He's saying there's a reality that lies behind us that should inform all of our decisions, that should inform all of our actions. So with new purpose, Paul refuses to give up even when he's facing imminent death and an uncertain future. He presses on towards this goal which he's called heavenward in Christ and it's to a better life, a better example. And the fruit of that, soldiers' lives are changed. I sometimes think, and I I wonder whether or not, having been a Christian now since uh, I was 19, and uh, when I look at my Bible here and I read the inscription, this was given to me on my birthday, uh, which was just last... uh, Uh, Wednesday. Thank you very much for all your congratulations and cards and gifts and things like that. Um, 3rd of May, 1989, when I turned 19. And this was a gift from my brother and my sister. And, And this book has traveled so far. It has been at the bedsides of many people. Um, I've read from it when people have been weeping. I've read from it when we've been laughing. Uh, I've read from it when I've been with people who are disinterested or bored. But I remind myself that whatever I am now, it is as a result of the gift of Christ. Because before I threw myself into this book, everything that I pursued, everything that I wanted, everything that I aspired to be brought me my mother, my friends, my family, and the people around about me, nothing but frustration and sadness and brokenheartedness and disappointment. My purpose was pointed completely in the wrong direction. And at moments now, when my faith is challenged and when I doubt and when I wonder and when I just think, my goodness, I am reminded of that call. Where do I find inspiration? Where do I go to find hope? And it's, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. It's not the TikTok. It's not the YouTube. It's not to the news. It's 
to none of those sources, I find myself coming back to this book, meeting with the risen Christ, and being gently reminded that actually there's so much more yet to be experienced, and there's so much more yet to come. It might hurt at times. It might cost at times. It might lead to misunderstanding at times. But there is a beauty in friendship with Christ that just outshines it all. And Paul, how does he do this? He prays. He prays continuously. I think as church sometimes we undervalue the power of prayer. I think as church sometimes we can feel that our prayers don't matter or that our prayers are not heard. Um, There's a little prayer group meets on a Tuesday lunchtime, sometimes in my office, sometimes in the Miles Hall. There's about 15 lads get together for a really short Bible study and they just take a moment to pray for each other. They pray for their friends. They pray for their sports teams. They pray for their pals who have been injured. They pray for those who are struggling with their friendships. They pray for those who are unwell. And um, they pray for people who stand in need of healing. And they were praying recently for my best friend Patrick and for his wife Caroline for her healing. Um, She was diagnosed um, just recently Uh, with stage four bile cancer and uh, she passed away just before Easter and after the Easter holidays when I came back to the prayer group they asked Mr. Mackey how is Patrick's wife Caroline and I said guys I'm really sorry to say but Caroline passed away just uh, in in the middle of the Easter holidays and uh, I said though can I tell you Patrick said to me will you tell the boys in Wesley thank you for their prayers We knew in the hospital when those guys were praying, we could feel it. They're praying in my office in Dublin, and they knew that the Spirit was moving in a hospital ward in Altmagalvin in Derry. I love that. I absolutely love that. We don't have to be witnesses to the answers to our own prayers. Because we don't pray just to effect change. We don't pray just to turn the world upside down. We don't pray just to get our way or get an answer. We pray because we're pressing into Jesus. We're praying to be transformed. That's what we're doing. We're praying to be better people, to choose the better way. Are you under pressure today? Are you going home to angst? Are you going home to uncertainty? Are you meeting it in the office tomorrow when you're sitting in traffic and people are driving you crazy? Can I encourage you? Choose the better way. Christ chose the way of the cross. It's a way of shame. It's a way of torture. It was the way of death. It was miserable, it was dreadful, it was awful. There's nothing good about this. But he was willing to do it because he loved greatly and it cost him greatly. But in experiencing that level of suffering, driven by love, pursuing the heart of the Father, what is the fruit of that tree? It's not bitterness, it's not angst, it's not disappointment. It's resurrection life. I remember kneeling in a room in a bed set in Port Rush and giving my life to Christ. And as God said, Nigel, I want every breath. I want it all. And I'm like going, I have a major problem with that, but I'll trust you if you're talking to me out loud and I can hear you. I'll trust you, even though I can't see you. And the transformation that took place. I still live out of that moment. I still orientate myself because of that decision. And when I look at Paul, murderous, angry, afraid, insecure, 
cocky, all the things, you know, thinking he's got it all sorted, and he meets with Jesus. And he's, he's not just blinded by the light, he's blinded by his own purpose, by his own selfishness, by his own greed, his own stupidity. And then we see Paul in chains before the Praetorian Guard, as free as he's ever been, able to love, able to embrace, able to ask how you're doing, able to pray, changing lives, amazing. We're called to be people like Paul, the people of God. Let's pause for a minute together as we pray. Let us pray. Lord, there's war on our continent today. There's war on other continents. There's not just small groups of people afraid to be alive on this wonderful planet today. There's entire nations in turmoil. So we pray that you will help each of us to press into the peace that only Christ can give and bring. Help each of us in our hearts and our attitudes and our actions to choose the better way. And we pray that as we ask in your name today for change to happen, that there will be an effect in Ukraine that there will be an effect in Russia and Chechnya, that there will be an impact in Sudan, that there will be an effect in Yemen and in Afghanistan, that there will be lives transformed in Syria and in refugee camps in Lebanon and Jordan. We pray for peace today in our world. And Lord, for leaders who just want to pass on the pain of those who have gone before or those who are behind them whispering in their ear, the pain of insecurity, the pain of worry, the pain of self-doubt, we pray that you would open their eyes, as with Paul, that the scales would fall off and that they would see there is a better way in pursuing kingdom values in their nations, in their governments, and in their policies. We pray especially for our Taoiseach today. May you surround him with your love, with your goodness, with your grace and your power. May he and all the cabinet ministers know your blessing. Blessing. We pray for our neighbors, both north and across the water. And that as a king was crowned to serve yesterday, may they as a nation seek to serve each other, preferring one another's needs over their own. We pray for ourselves today. There are those of us facing anxiety. Facing financial difficulty. Facing huge choices about our future. About courses we should accept. About colleges we should go to. About careers we should pursue. Give us all peace in our hearts we pray. May we know your leading and your guiding. And whatever the cost of the choice of doing what is right and what is good, may each of us know you in this life and in the life to come 
in the power of your resurrection. For we humbly ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand to sing our next hymn now. It's number 287, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. standing for the great prayer of thanksgiving. The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, peace be with you. Then they were glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. The peace of the risen Christ to always be with you and also with you. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give our thanks to the Lord our God. Blessings and honor, glory, and power are rightly yours, our gracious God. By your creative word, you brought the world to birth. In your generous love, you made the human family, that we might see your glory and live forever in your presence. 
blessings and honors grow in power as our ears are gracious to us. When we wandered from you in our sins, you sought us with your steadfast love and did not give us up. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son to be our Savior and Deliverer. Made of flesh and blood, he lived our life and died uh, our death upon the cross. Death could not hold him, and now he reigns at your right hand. Blessing and honor, glory and power are rightly yours, O gracious God. Thank you, Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we bless and praise your glorious name, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed indeed is the Lord Jesus Christ who at supper with his friends took bread and gave you thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, take this all of you and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Well, death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. When supper was ended, he took the cup and gave you thanks, gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for everyone for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, we celebrate this Passover of gladness, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Except through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of praise. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us the body and blood of Christ. Gather us who share in this feast into the kingdom of your glory, that with you, with all your people in every time and place, we may praise and worship you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit all honor and glory are yours, Heavenly Father, now and always. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Please be seated. you guys to give out the bread once everybody's up and uh, gathered. Okay, and I'll do the cup and I'll follow around after you. And then once you're finished, just come back and put it on the table and leave. Will you please come forward? So, you'll start at this end. Lord our God, we give you thanks because you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as by his resurrection we are brought to new life, so by his continued reign in us we may be brought to eternal joy through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. We stand to sing our closing hymn this morning, number 608, All Praise to Our Redeeming Lord.
encourage one another as we share together in the words of the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.